Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Radiologist YouTube account. Today we're going to have a look at the system I actually use every day in looking at a frontal chest x-ray. Now I'm not saying this is the only way to look at a chest x-ray, but hopefully there are things from here that you can take and use in your own system for looking at a chest x-ray. So here we go. I found that by using a system, I'm far less likely to miss things than if I don't. And when I do miss things, it's usually when I'm tired or stressed and I haven't gone through my usual routine. Also, the problem may be that you find an abnormality and you stop there. You're pleased that you spotted it and so you just don't look any further and that can lead to missing things as well. I've also found just by being more robotic in my approach that I have been more efficient Instead of just looking at a scan aimlessly, looking at the same things over and over, I'm more efficient looking at each area in focus once and that reduces the time that I look at a film or a scan. So we've decided we're going to use a system, which system are we going to use? There are a few already out there, one such system is the ABCDE system and I think if you're first starting out this isn't a bad system to use, however I don't know many radiologists that would use that system. Most now. radiologists I know will use a personalized system that they've built up through many years of looking at x-rays, of seeing things that either they've missed or other people have missed, and that's what works best for them. And I would highly suggest that if you're gonna look at a lot of x-rays over time, that you personalize your own system to you, because that will mean more to you, and you're more likely to remember it and stick to it. So the first thing I usually do is look at the technical factors and if you haven't already please do check out the video I filmed on specifically this on the technical factors. So we're not going to go into this in detail in this talk. Once I've done that I make the x-ray really small and that just changes my perspective on things and it will just give me a good overview of everything that's going on on the x-ray. Is there any major pathology? Is there a big lung mass? Is there a large effusion? It's also a good chance to have a look at your lung volumes. Now you're already assessing this when you look at the inspiration, but I find it's just a good time just to compare side by side and see are those lung volumes equal? Are they reduced, normal, or are the lungs hyperexpanded? And remember, you may see hyperexpanded lungs in emphysema. I then look at all the tubes and lines and make sure they're sitting in the right place. Again, if you haven't, do check out the video that I filmed on assessing position of the NG tube placement. But essentially, this is a really important thing that you want to get out of the way early. And you want to make sure A, all the tubes and lines are in the right place. And B, there are no other foreign bodies on the film that shouldn't be there. There are examples where there have been retained foreign bodies on an x-ray, on serial x-rays, and everybody's just ignored it because there's so much going on in the film. So especially on those busy ICU films, take the time at the beginning to make sure everything you see can be accounted for and everything is where it should be. Now we're getting on to the main course after the starters. And I first have a look at the lung apices. When I do so, I zoom right up on the apices, and there's a few good reasons for that. So I'd split this into three different categories. Firstly, I'm looking for a pancos tumour. So I'm looking at the spaces between the ribs to see that they're equal on both sides. Asymmetry in this, if you have a density on one side that you can't see on the other, that could be a subtle sign that there is a pancos tumour. So look between the ribs. Also look at your bones and make sure they're equal on both sides. So look at the ribs, look at the medial clavicles, and then next look for a pneumothorax. So this can be really subtle, and this is why I think it's really important to zoom up on the apices. So the two things I would say are important to look for when you're looking for a pneumothorax. Firstly, are there any lung markings? So look between the ribs again. Can you see linear structures on either side? Here, just about, I think we can make out there is a linear structure. But this can be really difficult, and so if you aren't seeing any lung markings, particularly in patients with emphysema when they've got bully at the apices, you need to look for the second feature of an apical pneumothorax on a chest x-ray, and that's a pleural line. So what is a pleural line? Well, 
let's consider what the lung normally looks like on an x-ray. You shouldn't see anything within the pleura. You can't really make out the visceral and parietal pleura. But in cases of a pneumothorax, you then get gas in the pleural space. And those two layers of the pleura, the parietal and visceral pleura, come apart. So it's that visceral pleura that you're looking for. And that's what gives you a pleural line, which manifests as a thin white line. Let's have a look at this x-ray. So if this feels very busy, there's a lot going on here. Firstly, there's some kind of device on the right side. Secondly, we can see there's some kind of lesion here in the right upper zone. Now this is what I'm talking about, satisfaction of search. You might say, well, that's enough. Let's move on to the next thing. We've called all the abnormalities on this x-ray. Well, then that's why it's important to go through your system. Zoom up and then you'll see lung markings on the left side but on the right side there are no lung markings that should set the alarm bells ringing so that's part one what's part two of a pneumothorax your pleural line so you're looking for a thin white line paralleling the chest wall and that's what you've got here this is what it looks like so we can see the visceral pleura and above that there's gas in the pleural space this is a case of a pneumothorax which has happened post biopsy of a lesion and this device on the right side is a type of chest drain, a pleural vent aimed to try and reduce the pneumothorax, although at the moment it's not completely resolved. So to recap, with pneumothorax you're looking for firstly no lung markings and secondly a pleural line, a white thin line parallel to the chest wall. So we've looked for Pankow's tumour, we've looked for pneumothorax, What's the third thing I do with the lung apices? Well, there's so many overlying bones here, it gets confusing. So I think it's really useful to just take a moment and try and piece it all apart. And I start by outlining this, the transverse process of the T1 vertebra, the first thoracic vertebra. How do I know this is what I'm looking at? Well, if you notice, this transverse process is pointing up and the one above is pointing down. And the key point here is cervical transverse processes point down and thoracic transverse processes point up. So that tells us that this is the thoracic transverse process pointing up of T1 and this is a cervical transverse process pointing down of C7. And this acts as a landmark for where you should find your first rib. So you should find that coming off the first thoracic vertebra. So here we can see it. This is the posterior part and the anterior part is a bit that you can't see as well. So remember the posterior parts are usually more horizontal. The first rib is slightly more vertical than the others. And then the anterior ribs are more vertical and you can't see them as well. This is the second rib. This is the posterior part and this is the anterior part. And I'm looking for fractures. I'm looking for subtle rib erosions. I'm looking even for a missing rib, which you can sometimes get with lung tumours. Once I've done that, I then just glance upwards and just check out, is there a scrawny little rib coming off that C7 vertebral body, which might represent an incidental cervical rib, which is important to look at. If the patient ever develops neurological symptoms in one of their arms in the future, well, then you've got a good reason for why that might be. So we've covered the lung apex. Now we're going to move on to bones in general. And I like to get this out of the way because I find this a little bit boring, but it's really important because a subtle rib erosion might be the only problem on an x-ray. So it's really important to take all the bones one by one in turn. We've started by looking at the first and second rib at the lung apex, and then I'll look at the rest of the anterior rib. So there's one and two. I'll follow them all the way down and whilst I'm zoomed up I'm going to scroll all the way down looking at all of the anterior ribs. Once I've got to the bottom I'll then have a look at the lateral aspects and the posterior ribs and scroll all the way back up to the top and I'll do that on one side and then I'll do that on the other and then that's ribs ticked off. Once I've done the ribs, seeing as I'm still in the middle, I'll then have a look at the clavicle, starting at the medial clavicle and going out to the distal clavicle and then the scapula. And I'll do that on one side and then I'll do that on the other. Lastly, with the bones, it's the vertebra. So you're looking behind the mediastinum here and seeing if you can outline each of the vertebra. So whilst I'm zoomed up again, I'll have a look and I'll scroll all the way down, carefully looking at each vertebra, looking to see if there's any collapse looking to see if there's a paravertebral mass or lesion that might be there. 
So now we can tick off apices and bones and we can go on to the mediastinum. So I was singing nursery rhymes with my daughter one day when all of a sudden it just struck me, pat -a cake is the perfect mnemonic for assessing the mediastinum. Okay, well, it didn't hit me like that. But needless to say, this has revolutionized the way that I look at a mediastinum on a chest X-ray because it gives me a nice system to review the mediastinum from top to bottom and hits all of the key points. It starts off with P, and paratracheal. So what I'm looking for is the right paratracheal stripe, and what you should see is a thin stripe to the right of the trachea. That might be thickened or widened if there's abnormal lymph node enlargement, which might happen with TB, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, or might be spread from a lung cancer. It's easier to see in this case that the paratracheal stripe is normal. In elderly people, you may see more of a density here in this right apex representing the vessels and vascular structures. So how do you tell the difference between that and lymph node enlargement? Well it can be quite tricky but one thing I try and do is compare it to the density of the aorta. If it's similar or less you're probably okay. If it's more dense than the aorta, i.e. it's more white, then that's worrying. Then we have this, the azygous vein. So what you're looking for is this little nubbin just above the right main bronchus. Now the azygous vein drains the mediastinum and the thoracic and abdominal walls. It starts off in the abdomen, heads up vertically within the posterior mediastinum and then hooks around and drains into the SVC. And this is what it looks like on a CT scan. What are you looking for when we're reviewing it on a chest x-ray? Well, you're looking to see if that contour is enlarged. And that might happen if the azygous vein is dilated in cases where the SVC or IVC are obstructed, but you also might get an enlarged contour when there's lymph node enlargement in that region, again because of TB, because of sarcoid, because of lymphoma. Now this might be very subtle and can be the only abnormality on a chest x-ray, which is why it's important for you to have this in your system. And T stands for trachea, which should be central. Important to note that in older people, you can get a dilated ectatic aorta, which can push the trachea off to the right slightly, and that can be normal in those patients. And A stands for the aorta and the AP window, the aortopulmonary window. So this is the aortic knuckle. And I'm looking to see firstly that it's there. In some people, the aorta can be on the right side rather than the left. And you're looking to see its contour is clearly defined. So in cases of trauma, or primary lung cancer, you may see an ill-defined aortic contour. You may also get this in acute aortic dissection where you've got hematoma within the mediastinum. I then look to see if I can see this, the pulmonary trunk below the aortic knuckle and then the AP window, the aortopulmonary window. And what you're looking for is a concavity and this is what it looks like on the CT scan. So you're looking to see if you can outline a concave window in there. What you shouldn't see is this, a convexity. And if you do see that, you're thinking about lymph node enlargement, you're thinking about primary lung cancer. Like the other abnormalities, this can be the only abnormality on the chest X-ray. So it's important that you take the time to look for it. The C of patacake stands for carina. And here you're looking for where the trachea bifurcates into the right and left main bronchus. It should be roughly this angle, so about 60 or 70 degrees, less than a right angle. If it's more than a right angle, then you're getting to territory where you can say the carina is splayed. Commonly, this happens due to left atrial enlargement, but it can happen because of a mass or an enlarged lymph node in the subcarinal region. Some people consider this to be quite a soft sign because there is a fair bit of anatomic variation in what the carinal angle should be. The way I use it is if I see an abnormality elsewhere, such as an obliterated AP window, then seeing a splayed carina will just sway me towards, yes, there is definitely an abnormality going on in the mediastinum. The third A stands for the azagoesophageal recess. So we come down a little bit for this one. You may not see this in every patient, but in those where you've got a good penetration and they're fairly slim, you may be able to make out this faint white line. And what this represents is the interface between the right lung and the azygous vein and esophagus. Why should we look for it? Well, if you see a bulge in this line, that may represent an abnormality in either the posterior or the middle mediastinum. 
Now I'm pushing it a little bit with this one, but K stands for the K-shaped hyla regions. If I could convince you that the hyla regions look like a K or a backwards K on the right side. Now what you're trying to do here is make out what we call the hyla points on both sides. So the point where the pulmonary vessels converge onto each other. And the first thing I do is look at their position. So I draw a line between the two hyla points on each side. And I think to myself, are these hyla in the right position? So the rules I like to follow with the hyla position is one, don't talk about the hyla position. And two, don't talk about the hyla position. Wait, no, that's Fight Club. That's got nothing to do with this at all. These are the real hyla position rules. Number one, they can be at the same height. That's absolutely fine. Number two, the left can be two centimeters above the right, but shouldn't be any more than that. And three, the right cannot be above the left side. Why are these rules important? Well, if you can't follow those rules, there's been some kind of architectural distortion that may mean fibrosis. It also may mean collapse of a lobe of a lung, which can be a sign of a lung cancer. So it's important to know that your hyla regions are in the right place. Once I've dealt with position, I then move on to two other things, checking the morphology and the density. So in terms of morphology, you're making sure that everything that you can see there can be represented by a vessel and not a mass or a large lymph node. So you're looking for structures like this, vessels that taper off. You may see some circles because remember you'll be seeing some vessels head on and that's okay, but no large lumps or bumps. In terms of density, you wanna make sure that each side looks the same and it's a similar level of greyness. And E is a bit of a cop out, but E stands for everything else, which for me is three things. Number one, looking at the heart contour. So when I say that, what do I mean? Well, looking at this diagram, I'd like to think there are four bumps on the left side of the mediastinum. Number one, aortic arch. Number two, pulmonary trunk. Number three, left atrial appendage. And number four is the left ventricle. On the right side, the right-sided heart contour is formed by the right atrium. So I try and mark out all of those bumps. So we've already looked at the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, but here we can also see the left atrial appendage and then the left ventricle. And you're looking for a clean contour. Remember, if you get consolidation abutting the left ventricle, left atrial appendage, that contour will be lost and you therefore have consolidation in the lingula of the left lung. Similarly, on the right, I'm looking to see that I can clearly define the right atrial contour. If you lose that with consolidation, then you've got consolidation in the right middle lobe. And that is known as a loss of silhouette sign. I then look behind the heart to see that the density looks the same on either side of the spine. So look on the right and compare it to the left. Here's another case. And in this example, if I can try and convince you that the right side looks far more dense than the left side. Once we see that, what are we thinking about? There's a few things it could be, the most common of which is probably lung consolidation or lung collapse. You also might see hiatus hernia, so there you're looking for a fluid level. If you see that behind the heart, it's probably a hiatus hernia. But also remember that lung cancers can manifest as a retrocardiac opacity as well. In this case, the opacity behind the heart was due to a dilated esophagus, which is confirmed on CT. And the third thing I look for is pneumomediastinum. So you're looking around the contour of the heart again, and you're looking to see if there's an excessive amount of lucency surrounding the heart, possibly with another white line around that lucency. Now remember, it's normal to see a little bit of a shadow around the heart, and that's because of something called the Mac effect. And that is completely normal. So this case is normal, and it's important to get your eye in by looking at lots of x-rays to know just what normal looks like. The next part of my x-ray review reminds me a little bit of a pinball machine, funnily enough. You know with those pinball machines, you push down on the levers, the balls move down and they go all the way around the machine, and. They and then they go into the main part of the game. And the same goes for my review of a chest x-ray. So I'm going down the mediastinum with my patacate mnemonic. I'm checking out the cardiophrenic angles. I then have a look underneath the diaphragm looking for any free gas. Also remembering that the lungs extend really far down, probably more than you expect. So looking for any consolidation in those areas going out all the way to the costophrenic angles, looking to see if there's any blunting that might represent a small pleural effusion. And then I'm going all the way round, looking at the lung peripheries. 
And the reason I'm looking here is because it's quite easy to miss small lung nodules, little bits of consolidation, and also masses related to the pleura or chest wall. Once I've done that, I'm on the home straight and I'm inverting the x-ray just to give myself another perspective. So again, I'm looking at the lungs, looking to see if there's any nodules that are jumping out at me. I'm looking behind the heart, and then I'm also looking at the soft tissues. I've already looked at the bones earlier, but now I'm specifically looking at the soft tissues, including the breast shadows in female patients, and also looking for any gas that you might get in surgical emphysema. Once I've done all of that, I can be fairly certain I've covered all of the bases. So to recap what we've looked at, firstly, we've started by looking at the technical factors and please do check out my other video for more information on that. I've then zoomed right out just to get another perspective on the x-ray looking at the lung volumes. I've checked for any tubes and any lines accounting for everything that I can see on the film, making sure all the tubes are in the right place. I've zoomed up on the lung apices, looking for pancos tumour, looking for pneumothorax, looking for bones. I've then specifically looked at all of the other bones, I looked at all the ribs, the clavicles, the scapulae and all the vertebrae as well. I've then gone down the mediastinum using my patacake mnemonic, looking for subtle findings. I've then used my pinball method to go under the diaphragms, looking at the costophrenic angles and then going round the lung peripheries as well. Last off, I've inverted the film just to give myself another perspective before checking the soft tissues as well. So after I've done all of that, I can be confident in myself that I've done the best job I can to look at that x-ray and I've given myself every chance to pick up any subtle findings. Hopefully you found this useful. Now I'm not saying this is the way that you should look at a chest x-ray, but hopefully I've shown you some things that you can start to incorporate within your own system. And hopefully this can help you in the future. If you found this video useful, check out my other videos and please do subscribe to see more videos like this coming up. Thank you very much, bye.